Mr. Chairman, <coughs> thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this debate um, and also to be at your conference. Um, obviously, with a, a title like um, Traditional Britain, um, you might think that some of what I'm going to say is um, perhaps a bit of a challenge to that. Um, I know you recently had trouble with the supposedly honourable member for North East Somerset. <laughs> You seem to make much, much play of being a traditional conservative up until then. <laughs> Do I dare mention his name, Mrs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a man who not, who not only publicly bit your hand but fed him, but has recently said, and I quote, education and health policy in England will be made by people who cannot vote on those self-same subjects for their own districts. This is absurd and very unfair on the English. Those of us who are English, he said, should feel that this is a price worth paying for the United Kingdom. That's not a sentiment that appeals to me, ladies and gentlemen. I think that English national interests should be pursued by our own English national government, democratically elected by the English people. Perhaps re-smog is a new word for quizzling. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the title of my speech today is, uh, as your chairman said, The Future of the World's Oldest Nation State, England. One of the objectively obvious facts, which it seems that many either left-wing internationalist or globalist, or indeed pro-EU-ish commentators overlook, is that nations and nationhood are not disappearing but on the contrary, they're increasingly popular. Mm. Just consider for a moment that during the course of the 20th century, a great many new nation states emerged. There are now 193 member nation states in the UN. I think that sometimes, if we, if we try and stand back from things and just look objectively at an issue, you can sometimes see something that others may have overlooked in their haste. But the, the title of this conference, The Future of the Nation State, makes me think that all the clamour, which seems to suggest that the future of the nation, makes me think of all the clamour that, the, um, that uh, seems to suggest that the future of the nation state is a troubled one. However, one issue which we should try to avoid getting confused about is the fact that there may be often a great difference between the fact of a state, <coughs> albeit often confusingly called a nation-state, and the idea of a nation. The state, of course, is at root a state structure with a constitution and <coughs> systems of control and enforcement, and if it's an effective state, a monopoly of the legitimate use of force. <coughs> Whereas a nation, on the other hand, is a community in one real sense, and is based upon national feeling. So we could say, that a nation is a product of national identity, or as left-wing academics would refer to it, a nation is an imagined community. The people of a nation have a subjective sense of their national identity as being a member of their own wider national community. They may have in their minds many objective criteria which they will apply in deciding whether an individual is a member or not. This will depend on the peculiar ideas of that peculiar nation, particular nation. So, for instance, the idea of Americanism, or self-identifying as being an American, which has different characteristics to Frenchism, or as a word, which might, we might use to people who self-identify as being French. At this point, I'd like to draw an explicit distinction between this sense of national identity that I'm talking about and the bogus and false senses of, na of notions of, on the one hand, white race nationalism, and on the other, international proletarianism. In neither case do those ideologues who wish to pigeonhole people into such groups care that real people don't actually have any such sense of self-identification. On the contrary, they then arrogantly, and in my view undemocratically, claim that it is everyone else who is wrong, and they say, that everyone else has a false state of consciousness. I reject such ideas and wish to assert my democratic right to declare <coughs> my own national identity as an Englishman and as a member of the English nation. It is, of course, a fact 
that a state can be highly successful, but not yet be a nation. Consider, for example, some historical examples. Consider Prussia, which was mainly the conglomeration of territories ruled by the region's uh, then prince, the Ho or fam princely family, the Hohenzollerns. Or consider, as was mentioned earlier, the Habsburg Austro-Hungary. Or indeed, consider the Soviet Union. Such states are in a sense empires rather than nations and cannot survive defeat or collapse as they have little hold on the hearts and affections of their subjects. On the other hand, a nation can have a stronghold on the hearts of its people, but not be a state. Consider, for example, the Kurds, or modern Hungarians, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Polish, or along the troublesome frontier between the states of Pakistan and Afghan Afghanistan, the Patans, or Pashtuns. Problems often arise within states where there is no key element of integrated or integrated key element of coherent or integrated foundation of national identity. For example, in most African countries today, of the former British Empire, where British imperial policies, what we would today call multiculturalism, were instituted under the guise of divide and rule. I think it's instructive to consider a contrast between Ghana and Malaysia. <coughs> both countries that became independent more or less at the same time. Geographically, both are of a similar size. Both had similar sized populations, and both are even similarly, similarly near the equator. However, it's only Malaysia, with strong emphasis on Malay nationalism, that has managed to make the leap into becoming a largely developed country. I hope you see my point, that nationalism can be a key determinant of the success or failure of a state. How does all this matter in modern Britain, or for the future of England? Well, let us get some terms clear, and then things may come into focus. Britain was originally the name of the Roman province, which included Wales, and mostly went up only to Hadrian's Wall, and never included all of Scotland, or any of Ireland. England, another term, is arguably the oldest nation-state on earth. The idea of the English nation is first mentioned in literature by the Venerable Bede in about 731, who may well have invented the concept to try and bring together the disparate tribes of Jutes, Angles and Saxons, which had coalesced into the seven kingdoms of the Heptarchy in what is now England, and those kingdoms would probably never have come together as a single state under their own volition. Ladies and gentlemen, it's often claimed that all nationalisms arise in response to a threat. In the case of England and the English nation, that threat was the Vikings. And our great founder is Alfred the Great, who after his memorable burning of cakes, when he was a fugitive and the last serving Anglo-Saxon king, came back to win the decisive battle of Eddington against the Viking host in 878. Alfred then launched his Wessex kingdom on a mission to create a new kingdom of all the Anglosin with his burrs or boroughs and civic freedoms, reforms of the army, putting village life on the war production footing of the early medieval open field system, a system which continued right up until the Black Death. His encouragement of reading and writing in English, his translation of the Bible into English, his strongly Roman Catholic Christian mission, Alfred's policies were crowned with ultimate success by his grandson, Athelstan, on the 12th of July, 927, at the Council of Emont, when the then new state, England, was unified into a single kingdom on more or less its current borders. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just compare that length of history with the creation of a united Germany in 1871, or a united, or united Italy, in 1863, before that, before that uh, unification of Italy, Met Metternich had famously said that Italy was a geographical rather than a political idea. By contrast, we English have a united national history of over a thousand years. In all those years since then, England was never divided or separated into warring states, and so therefore 
The English nation has the deepest roots of all European nations. The only nation state in the world that has an equivalent claim is that of China. But I would question whether China isn't an empire rather than a nation, given its over 200 spoken languages. It has also several periods of, di of division into warring states since it was united under the first emperor. Another term we need to define is that of Great Britain. In 1603, there was the Union of the Crowns, with the accession of James I of England, who was also James VI of Scotland. But despite James's best efforts, there was no union of England and Scotland. In 1707, <laughs> the increasingly successful English state and nation entered into a partial union with the Kingdom of Scotland, which was there in deep financial trouble after its unsuccessful colonial adventure in Middle America. The Darwin adventure was a sort of Scottish South Sea bubble, where there was a speculative boom which bankrupted much of Scotland's elite and the Scottish state. The Scots at the time had a different act of succession, so it was feared that on the death of Queen Anne, the last Stuart monarch, there would be an end to the Union of the Crowns. The English threatened to end Scottish trading access to English markets under the Aliens Act, the first Aliens Act which was mentioned earlier, and eventually a sordid deal was done in what is now a public toilet in Edinburgh, <laughs> which meant that members of the Scottish elite would be bribed with English taxpayers' money and a partial union would be created by the union of the Kingdom of Scotland and the Kingdom of England into the newly coined term, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the origin of the term Great Britain. The purpose of this union of Great Britain was nakedly then about big power, real politic, and imperialist aspirations. Coupled with the struggle for imperial dominance and world power against, in particular, the absolutist Catholic monarchy of France. There was also a strong element of Protestantism at its foundation. We then move on to considering the United Kingdom of Great Britain and <coughs> Ireland, which was created in the last great struggle with France, this time in the Napoleonic Wars, and led to another partial union with the Kingdom of Ireland in 1801. In this case, it didn't even create a customs union or economic free trade zone between Great Britain and Ireland. When the Union of Ireland largely collapsed in uh, 1922, not only was the modern Conservative Party and its 1922 committee formed, but also there was yet another permutation of the Union state, with its new and current title, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The next term I'd like to consider, ladies and gentlemen, is devolution. In 1998, new Labour enacted, following strong success in their Scottish referendum and very marginal success in the Welsh referendum, devolution, national devolution in Scotland and in Wales. These devolutions were different from each other and began a process whose destination, it seems to me, can only naturally be the end of the UK. In Northern Ireland, of course, there is a special case arising from the peace agreement. For me, as an English nationalist, a key factor to take into account in, its cons in considering devolution is, of course, that there was no national devolution for England. On the contrary, the only attempt to devolve in England was an attempt to break England up into EU-inspired regions. This gives us another term, regionalisation. This was policy first pursued by John, the John Major government following Maastricht, but most enthusiastically pursued in office by New Labour. The attempt to break England up led to a spectacular failure to get any democratic mandate for regionalisation in an area which Labour had created by gerrymandering the so-called region of the North East. <clears throat> Here, devolution was defeated by a full 79% of the electorate of the North East in 2004. There is no coincidence, I would suggest, that the so-called North East is one of the areas which has the strongest English national identity. 80.5% in the 2011 census. Ladies and gentlemen, next year, on the 19th of September 2014, we have the possibility of another great change to the Union. Perhaps it's very dissolution if Scotland votes, and I think it may well, for independence. You may ask how this would cause the dissolution of the United Kingdom. Well, I have partially answered that question already, but going back again to history to help 
to show how that applies to our constitutional law. The union of the crowns of England and Ireland took place in the Middle Ages. But in 1536, the Principality of Wales, which had never historically coalesced into a long-standing single sovereign state, was incorporated by an act of union. But this union was a full incorporation of the Principality into the Kingdom of England. This got MPs for Welsh constituencies sitting in the English House of Commons. Wales was integrated into English law and included in the English judicial assize circuits and also had established the Church of England in Wales. <clears throat> in 1603, as I mentioned, there was the Union of the Crowns of Scotland and England. <clears throat> in 1707, the Union of the English and Scottish Parliaments let some Scottish lords sit in the English with the English lords, and some Scottish MPs sit in what had been the English Commons. But there never was, and never has been, and never will be, any union of the Scottish and English churches or of the two legal systems of the two countries. In 1801, there was the union of the United Kingdom of Great Britain's Parliament with the Irish Parliament, but as I said, no customs union, nor a union of the legal systems, but the Church of, Eng of Ireland was Anglican and Episcopalian. Bear in mind, however, that this further act of union of 1801 is grafted onto the foundation stone of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, brought about expressly in the 1707 Act of Union by the merger of the kingdoms of Scotland and England into that new United Kingdom of Great Britain. It therefore follows logically and legally that if Scotland secedes, then the United Kingdom of Great Britain is ipso facto dissolved and so is the subsequent Irish Union, as that was with the United Kingdom of Great Britain. The Northern Irish rump of the 1801 Union would then no longer have any constitutional entity to be attached to. So in late 2014, the British establishment politicians may have to scrabble about to cobble together a new union. But if Scotland goes, then the Union of Great Britain is dissolved from any sensible constitution or legal perspective. Who can say what the other constituent parts of the current union will then want to do? And here I would just like to remind you what the current First Minister of Wales, the Labour Party's Mr. Carwin Jones, said at a meeting in the London School of Economics earlier this month. Here's what he said, and I quote, <clears throat> Imagine a referendum of the European Union which resulted in a vote to leave, carried by the weight of English votes, against the preferences of other parts of the UK to remain in membership. That would put us under enormous strain and could only serve the interests of those who want the United Kingdom to cease to exist. It is ironic, he said, that those who are pressing for an in-out referendum on the grounds of their commitment to the United Kingdom may actually be imperiling the very future of the United Kingdom as presently constituted. And that would be a matter of grave concern for the majority of people in Wales. Wales remaining part of the United Kingdom benefits our economy. The UK works for all its constituent nations, and all have contributed to its success. I want the Union to flourish and Wales to play a dynamic role in it. But for this to happen, the structures of the UK must adapt to the changing identities and aspirations of its citizens. Oh, the irony of Ed, of Ed Miliband's recent sloganising at the Labour conference about Labour's one nation vision. Which nation is that? I would ask Mr Miliband. But coming back to that maelstrom of negotiations which would inevitably arise if Scotland votes to go, I would ask everyone here to search their minds carefully for an answer to this question. Who then will speak for England? One contender might be Mr Cameron, the British Prime Minister. He's a man who's on record as having promised to fight Little Englanders wherever he finds them. And he asserted to the BBC's Andrew Marr that he'd keep the colossal labour subsidy for Scotland going, despite being an MP of an English constituency, because he said, and I quote, I am a Cameron, and there is quite a lot of Scottish blood flowing in these veins. Is that, ladies and gentlemen, a race point, or what? <laughs> so would it be Dave Donald Cameron that speaks for England? Or would it be the Dutch-Russian Nick Clegg, 
Or Ed Miliband, whose Marxist father fled here from the Nazis, and who ungratefully seems to have wished us to lose both the Second World War and later the Cold War. Not to mention the Falklands War. <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, none of them care a damn for England. Indeed, all three have been trying to break England up with their party's respective regionalisation policies. Is it a coincidence, I wonder, that this is the very England that Karl Marx mourned as the rock upon which all the revolutions of Europe were wrecked? I've mentioned the term regionalisation. Policy of regionalisation is the British establishment's vision for England's future. It was introduced by the Conservatives to break us up into EU regions. Regionalisation was enthusiastically pursued by Labour, and whose purpose was said explicitly by Charles Kennedy when he was leader of the Liberal Democrats, saying he enthusiastically supported regionalisation for England because, he said, and I quote, it was calling into question the very idea of England itself. It is in this sense that the new post-colonial Britishness, having lost its empire and collapsed its power and nearly exhausted its credit over the last hundred years, is now a threat to our English nation. A nation, an English nation, which some commentators have pointed out recently, is now the last British colonial possession the last part of the world directly ruled by the British state. As Jeremy Paxman said, England is now something of a Scottish Raj. There's an English Mahatma Gandhi when you want one. <laughs> Our former colonial master, or should I say dear leader, Gordon Brown, went so far as to call the nations and regions of, of Britain, talk of the nations and regions of Britain, with England called the regions. He restructured the English natu national curriculum to ensure Britishness classes were given to English children, whereas the devolved governments of Scotland and Wales, of course, teach their own children mm -hmm. the value of their own nations. This is all part of a wider effort to propagandise English people into accepting the dissolution of the English nation and the use of our resources to unfairly subsidise Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland under what is known as the Barnet Formula. In early 2009, a cross-party committee of the House of Lords reported that the Barnet Formula subsidy to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland was running at the tune of £49 billion pounds a year. Mm -hmm. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, £49 billion pounds a year, almost half the entire UK budget deficit. The good news, though, ladies and gentlemen, is, if you're English, that the English are awakening. Consider the results of the Labour-supporting think tank, the IPPR, which reported in July 2013. Well, the IPPR is the enemy talking, really, because they, they are they, uh, one of the Labour support groups that were particularly active in trying to promote regionalisation. Um, and they are still trying, in fact. <coughs> and their latest scheme is for a northern parliament and, and a southern parliament for England. So this is by no means a report from our friends, and the report's authors include not one single <coughs> English patriot. The results are therefore all the more striking. Here are some important extracts. The level of British identity recorded was the lowest in any survey reported here going back to 1996. These are quotations from the report. Um, but, and I'm only reading a few of them to be relieved to know. Um, only 10% of respondents claim to be more British than English. In this sense, there was no discernible post-Olympics Britishness bounce. 58% agree that the English have become more aware of English national identity in recent years. There is, however, one significant exception, which the report found, in the strength of English national identification. That exception, will be no surprise to anybody, I don't suppose, here, was London. In the dual capital of England and the United Kingdom, the report goes on, whilst English national identity remains the most popular choice, Englishness was noticeably weaker than elsewhere, and Britishness rather stronger. <coughs> that fully 40% of people in England, the report says, would have given the opportunity to choose an English passport. They say that's striking, especially given the complete absence of any public debate around English citizenship. 
Across all age groups, social classes, and both genders, Englishness is stronger than Britishness. But one important exception concerns members of England's ethnic minorities. The English have constitutional concerns, the report identified. <laughs> Scotland was felt to receive more than its fair share of public spending, and England less than its fair share. The English also overwhelmingly believe that public services should be delivered in Scotland, funded by taxes levied in Scotland, and that Scottish MPs should not be allowed to vote on English laws. Also striking is the lack of trust in, U in the UK government to act in England's interest. <laughs> Around 60% of respondents did not think that the UK government could be relied upon to do so. Such sentiments, the report says, are widespread across England. Although Londoners appear a little less dissatisfied than the English average, there is a striking regional uniformity in views. The overall message is clear. English dis disaffection with the territorial status quo is both broad and deep. The UK's relationship with Europe was accorded the highest priority on the question of saliency. But strikingly, the question of how England is governed now that Scotland has a parliament and that Wales has an assembly was in a clear second place, well ahead of a range of other constitutional issues, including voting reform, reform of local government and the House of Lords, and even the position of Scotland within the UK, to which the political system itself has accorded much higher priority in recent years. On the question of independence, the report says, Equally, English independence might be seen as a potential response to the electorate's call for action. We broached this possibility for the first time in our 2012 survey and garnered an intriguing response. Despite no significant political party or actor advocating this option, those supporting the proposition that English should become an independent country, 34%, were only narrowly outnumbered by those in opposition, 38%. And when asked how they would respond if Scotland were to vote to become independent, a plurality, 39%, compared with 33% who disagreed, then said that England too should become independent. So the, Scot the, the response has confirmed low and decreasing support for the status quo, very low support for English regionalisation, strong support for a form of government that treats England as a, dis as a distinct political unit. Continuing lack of consensus, however, about which English option is appropriate. It confirms low support for the ter ter territorial status quo. When respondents were asked to choose directly between English votes on English laws or an English parliament, they split their votes almost e evenly, and both options were more popular than the status quo. The status quo is currently and consistently less favoured than alternatives, which would give some form of institutional recognition to England as a whole. Our data the report says, shows a strong, consistent and unambiguous link between Euroscepticism and English rather than British national identity. For example, when asked whether or not UK membership of the EU is good or a bad thing, negative views were much more prevalent towards the more English end of the identity spectrum. Conversely, and, against, and again counter to received wisdom, attitudes to European integration are notably more positive amongst those with a more British identity. It is British identifiers who are the Europhile group in England, the report says. And this is a report that actually has more research backing to it than most reports of this nature do. Those who adopt the Eurosceptic position regarding EU membership as a bad thing, regarding EU membership as a bad thing, indicating they would vote for UK withdrawal from the EU, and regarding the EU as having most influence over the way England is run, are also notably more dissatisfied with the current status quo constitutionally in the UK. Euroscepticism and Debo anxiety, as the report calls it, are two sides of the same coin of English discontent. <coughs> Euroscepticism is also clearly associated with a demand for greater recognition for England in the UK's own constitutional arrangements. Also, and in many ways even more definitively, the 2011 census returns also show a strong rising sense of Englishness. England has over 32 million people, or over 60%, who have stated that they have only English national identity. A further 4.8 million, that's just over 
stated that their national identity is English and British. In sharp contrast with this nearly 70% being English, there are only a mere 10 million people, or 19.2%, who, who claim to be British only. A substantial proportion of these British only appear, from cross-referencing with the results of the census ethnicity question, to be of non-English ethnicity. On the question of demand for English independence, there is also increasingly, this is also increasing rapidly in England, and although at the moment it is still reactive to the movement of Scottish independence, it is not entirely dependent upon it. The June 2011 Comres survey done for the BBC showed that there was 36% support for England to be a fully independent country, irrespective of the result of the Scottish independence referendum. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in all our long history, there is a fully-fledged, but is yet small, with about 3,000 members, political party calling for the independence for England. That party, ladies and gentlemen, is the English Democrats. So, ladies and gentlemen, to answer the proposition in the title of this speech, I think that there are good grounds for some optimism as to England's future. I cannot finish, however, without suggesting, um, if I may slightly cheekily, that... Um, uh, that, that this uh, body might consider um, that um, some of the features of emergent English nationalism were, were things that would appeal to you. Uh, I mentioned um, that, uh, that the one feature is that uh, um, people want a whole England um, result, but the English, English nationalism seeks no cross-border subsidies, in particular Scotland to pay its own way. English nationalism clearly from the reports, seeks an end to mass immigration. It seeks a celebration of St George's Day and other English festivals. It even seeks an English passport. However, I think that one of the key aspirations of English nationalism that will have instant appeal here is the demand to get England out of the EU. Yeah, yeah. This is an aspiration which seems to be contrary to the majority feeling in Scotland and Wales, according to opinion polls. One of, one of the interesting things is that the IPPR's research shows, as I've said, that the national identity which is most Europhile is, in fact, people who identify themselves as being British. As I said, to be a bit cheeky, perhaps uh, you might like to consider being a traditional England group. So, ladies and gentlemen, finally, can I suggest we take the EU Justice Minister, and indeed Senia Barroso, himself at his word. <laughs> I wasn't going to go quite that far. <laughs> um, they have repeatedly said that if Scotland leaves the United Kingdom, that as a new state, which is not a signatory to the EU accession treaties, Scotland would be automatically out of the EU. They went on to say that Scotland would then have to reapply, to rejoin. Ladies and gentlemen, that means that if England leaves the UK, we would be automatically out of the EU too. Can I ask, is there anyone here who's so yeah. Britishly Europhile that they'd want to take Mr. Barroso's advice and apply to rejoin the EU? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience.